morning, everyone. This is Metal Walt here from Metal Mayhem ROC. It's nine o'clock on a Friday. Yes, I said that right. Nine on a Friday. And we're having Canadian bacon and coffee with veteran metal drummer Sean Drover. Sean has been behind the kit for, what, four decades now, um, including lengthy stents in uh, Megadeth and other bands. But today we're here to talk to Sean about his brand new metal band, the kick-ass band Withering Scorn, as well as his back history. Sean, welcome to Metal Mayhem ROC. Thanks for having me on, guys. I appreciate it. So, uh, Sean, we uh, we wanted to get a little bit into the new album today. And, uh, of course, you know, look a little bit of your back history here. But uh, this is what now, the third or fourth band? I know. Right? So, uh, so how does that go? How does that go in terms of uh, being on the road together and stuff? I mean, look, yeah, I mean, we've been in bands on and off for 30 years now. You know, it's it's just funny how things come full circle. I mean, you know, think, look, you know, Glenn um, joined uh, King Diamond back in 98. And, uh, you know, they didn't need a drummer, obviously. So you know, it's been weird where when then Glenn got the Megadeth gig and I got the Megadeth gig and he left and I stayed. And, you know, but we've always kind of helped each other out musically and stuff. And whenever the, uh, the situation presented itself, we, uh, you know, would record. I helped Glenn with a, a, a project he did about four years ago called Walls of Blood. It's basically a solo album with a bunch of guest singers and musicians yeah. and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I helped him with that a little bit. And, you know, this is, you know, this is still exciting for us to be able to create new music. And, and uh, you know, we still love doing that. Glenn's had a recording studio now for almost 30 years, so. Being in a band with your brother and being on the road all the time, is this what it's like being in a metal band with your brother? <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> no. <laughs> we're, we're, you know what? Yeah, you know what? There's Obviously, there's uh, brothers who like to hit each other in the head. Uh, you know, we're not like that at all. We're, we're not prone to violence in any, in any way, shape, or form. It's, well, we're Canadian, so that's just not a, it's just not a nice thing to do, is it? Yeah, well, well we figured I'd tie in the hockey theme here, you know, well, get the Hanson you brothers, hockey, the Drover brothers. Right. right. Unless you play hockey, then you fight, and then you apologize to each other, and then go grab a beer. <laughs> That's exactly yeah. it. Yeah. That's exactly it. Now, it's all it's all good, though. But, uh, Sean, seriously, uh, congratulations on the new album. You know, I was thinking about this when we got the press come over from uh, from from Frontiers. I mean, it, it's a it's a heavy freaking album and it's a bit of an outlier for the kind of music that they sign. So just uh, talk about like, how did the project come together? Really, it was COVID was really the the start of it. You know, it, it shut our industry down flat. And, and obviously, most people couldn't go to work no matter what you were doing, you know. So my brother really kind of reached out and said, look, you know, no one's going on tour. We're not doing anything. Why don't we just start writing some new songs and just kind of. We started doing that, and then we asked um, our, our friend Joe DeBias, who was in a band called Fates Warning for many years yep, up, yep. up north, and uh, so he was on board. So the three of us started doing things, and um, you know, and then we reached out to uh, a fantastic singer who's been a friend of ours for a long time, uh, Henning Bossi from uh, from Germany, who's in a band called Metallium for many years, and yep. he was on board. So one one important thing, real quick, to mention was being that we c couldn't even leave the house, let alone go into a recording studio. Together, it was important to know that these people were set up at home with Pro Tools yeah. to be able to record. So, you know, um, everybody have everybody's set up that way. So, you know, uh, on and off for the past three years, we just kind of worked on this record. And, and uh, we finally finished it March of this year. And we started shopping it. And Frontiers was on board pretty quick. Within, I think, about two weeks, to be honest, they were they came up with a solid offer. And uh, and here we are. And that's kind of we we that was by design. We wanted to not just do a couple of songs and then shop it and all this stuff. It's like, look, you know, here's the record. If you like it, let's let's talk. And and Frontiers re literally said, you know, the next day, like we love the record, you know, and and we had an offer and a table from them within probably a day or two. So. Yeah, that's actually really, really, really cool because you don't hear that too much anymore. Usually it's kind of the other way around where you'll find artists will say, all right, we get signed to a label and then we decide what, what songwriting direction we're going to go into. This was like the old school way going backwards saying, here's your product, make us a good deal, sign a contract and let's move on here. So uh, really, really well done. Nice. So uh, wh what about the actual name of the band? I was curious about that. Where did that come from? Withering Scorn. That was the hardest part of doing this friggin' record was coming up with a name that everybody agreed on. I mean, seriously, I mean, it was like 
Joe would have a list of 15 names. I would have a list of 15 names. Glenn would have a bunch of names. And we could never agree on a name. It's like, after a while, it's like, dude, it's like, you know, or if we did agree upon a name, we would look it up and a band already had it. So yeah. it, I'm telling <laughs> you, it was the biggest pain in the butt. Um, and finally, I came up with this. I came up with what I'm going to It's an old term I heard on television years ago, and somehow it popped in my head. And I said, what about this? This, you know, it's certainly metal sounding, but it's a little different. And, you know, I've already looked it up. Nobody has this name. What do you think? And they're like, you know what? Well, that's pretty, that's pretty cool, you know? And and so we just went with it, you know? For, look, for me, we could have called it chocolate ice cream for all I gave a shit. You know what I mean? It's like, <laughs> let's just pick a name for, you know, this what this went on for months, dude. No joke. But, you know, really? we all, we all like the name and, and, uh, uh, there you go. So there's Judas Priest was taken. That's why we had to come up with something else. Yeah. Sean, seeing that this was a COVID project, how did you, um, were you guys all like you're in Georgia right now, even though you're from Canada, mm -hmm. where were the rest of the guys? Did the COVID lead, uh, make it easier? Cause it was remote assembly of this album. Well, certainly well, COVID or not, I mean, you, you know, with, with uh, the advent of Pro Tools now, it, mm -hmm. it enables people to record at various parts of the planet. So, you know, again, like I said, we did this during COVID, but yeah, we, we couldn't go into a recording studio together if we wanted to because of COVID. So we had to have players that were set up at home. You know, Glenn's up in Canada. He's up uh, um, in Windsor, just over the border from Detroit, okay. Michigan. You know, Henning's in Germany. Um, Joe is yeah. in Connecticut and I'm down here in Georgia. So, you know, COVID or not, we still could have done the record. But again, that that was kind of like why we decided to to do the record really was, was you know, because there was nothing else. There's nothing else going on. No one's going to play live. And and we just kind of use the situation to our advantage in, in terms of, you know, look, we have all this time. Why don't we utilize yeah. it in a positive manner? Which process yeah. do you prefer, uh, the, the the old school where you're in a room or the new school or a little bit of both? I like both. I mean, um, yeah, I really like doing it the old school way as well. But we're so everybody's so used to doing it, you know, in the uh, um, comfort of their own town or their own home, even, you know, it's and it's certainly a lot cheaper uh, to record it at home versus going in a studio paying $250 an hour, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, you know, and the, and the product, again, the, the quality of the production is, you know, is almost as, I would say 99% as good as going into a world-class studio. If you, if you use it properly, if you know what you're doing and get the right people to work on it. So, you know, but th yeah, to answer your question, I, I like both situations. Certainly. Well, Sean, uh, 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 the album, uh, the album art, right? I mean, I think this is something that John and I, we're old school guys. I'm 53. He's a couple years older than me. We love to buy our CDs and, you know, hold the <laughs> physical product, of course, still. But this is one of the better ones I've seen recently. I mean, I've looked at this thing over and over and it just obviously you have it up on your wall there, as you saw earlier. But what's the image here and, and who designed this? What were you trying to get at with the, the theme here? Well, an artist named Kieran, he was, I think he's out on the West Coast. He reached out to Joe saying, hey, he was, he's a big fan of Fate's Warning and stuff. He said, hey, if you ever need any artwork done, hit me up. And, and uh, I guess Joe looked at his repertoire of artistry that they have and stuff. And, and Joe reached out to Glenn and I and said, look, this guy's really good and he does great work. And so we all looked at it and um, we, he had all, all kinds of artwork that was done. And, and I, we picked this piece that was kind of, kind of fits the, uh, you know, the prophets of demise um, concept, I would say, you know, you know what I mean? Oh my it's, God, it's like you said a minute ago, right? We're, we're all old school. We want to hold the, the vinyl or the CD in our hands and have the whole experience of looking at artwork and reading credits and seeing the band pictures and all that stuff. So that was, you know, super important to us um, in all aspects to have everything kind of an old school way where we, we still believe in, in all that stuff, great artwork and, Mm -hmm. and all that stuff it still means something to us for for the people who buy the music you know that's that's dude it's really important you know just because you can get it on spotify free doesn't mean you should it's amazing for like the kind of like the fun work that john and i get to do and all the other people that you uh have conversations with it it brings a whole new level of appreciation back to it because you know here we are we have to review your product we have to absorb it we have to critic critique it 
But we go back in that old style where we read the liner notes, we read the press yeah, notes, yeah. we look at the order of the tracks. You know, okay, this album has eight tracks, and look at the lead track, and look at the end track, and look at the one that they placed at number five. Everything has a place, and it's important for us as your fans and your critiques to make sure that we're up on that. So we're right there with you, man, Sean. So it's a good thing. So, um, Sean, like, just again, I'm going back to the whole thing. So you had the band together, the songs written, and did then the album art and band name come, or was the band name there first? Um, no, we did not have the we did not have the artwork in place and things like that because we wanted to wait until we were offered a record deal and then went to the next phase, which is getting artwork and doing all this other stuff associated with making a record. So, um, but yeah, we we certainly had the band name. We had the record done. We had the band name, and that that was pretty much it. We didn't. We purposely didn't have any social media. Uh, we wanted to wait. Look, let's just do the big splash. When we do the announcement of, hey, th this is the new band. Yep. Then we did the social media, which if you go any of our social media pages, it's all in its infancy. You know what I mean? There's not a ton of um, content because we're a new band. So mm -hmm. and that's OK. You know, we're just we're we're doing it one fan at a time. You know what I mean? Whatever. Yep. Again, old school guerrilla tactics. Right. Yes. Go out there and. And pound it on social media and, and just uh, create awareness. And uh, that's what we're doing. You know, the good news is we're, we're, we've gotten stellar reviews for this record. So it's better than any, everybody saying it sucks, right? So we must be doing something. Oh, no, it right. really is. It's a, it, I say that all sincerely. It's a great record, Sean. It's like you guys have nailed it. So you got eight songs. What I think is cool is you put out a couple of uh, lyrical videos and then there's one performance video. Mm -hmm. So let's let's talk a little bit about like the opening track, because I think the way you open and end the album is just totally killer. But yeah, the song Profits of Demise. I mean, I'll give you my little take here. I mean, it's got that unplugged feel to start. And you can just feel the tension of the song building and, the, you know, building and then you know, you got the drumming and the and the guitar build, and then the song just explodes. And I really think it sets the tone for what this band is about. And you know, like if you were intending to say, all right, everybody's going to wonder who these guys are that we know. Here's what we are. So talk a little bit about that song, Prophets of Demise. Yeah, basically everything you said was pretty accurate. I mean, that, that was certainly by design to have those dynamics. Um, you know, it starts off with a nice, eerie, quiet guitar passes with some eerie keyboards in the background, you know, AKA old school eerie metal yep. stuff. And then it just kicks in and, and melts your face. I mean, that's, that's, you know, we like to experiment a lot with dynamics, you know, that's, you know, really that's what makes it when you play a nice clean part, when the heavy part comes in, it sounds like it's 10 times heavier when really it's not, but it just goes from a clean part to a heavy <laughs> part. So just, instead of just, you know, and we have those songs that are from start to finish, just heavy, 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 which is great. Yep. But, I like to really mix it up in terms of not writing the same song, you know, eight times. I think for, well, for me personally, that would get boring. And I'm, I'm assuming for a lot of listeners that would same song, you know, style uh, all the time, which is great. But for me, I like to, you know, I'm, I'm influenced by so many, we're all influenced by so many different kinds of metal and stuff. Yeah. So, you know, I love trouble and, and cattle mass just as much as I love Slayer and, and the, the super yeah. fast stuff and carcass and everything in between. So you put all these influences in this big melting pot for the last almost 40 years. And, and this is kind of what we come up with. So, you know, yeah, I just love the, the dynamics of that song. And uh, it's, you know, like you said a minute ago, the song placement is super important for us because we did it in terms of what would this be on vinyl? So the, the you know, four songs on side A, four songs on side B. So the fifth song is Dark Reflections, which right away in side two, that song kicks you right in the face. So that all, everything was done by design where we had the epic song is number four and the epic song is number eight, the last song on side A and side B. That's kind of how uh, more Joe than, and, and you know, Joe and myself, but more so Joe really uh, was, was adamant about, you know, having the right song placement and, uh, and he definitely hit a home run with that. No, definitely. The song Dark Reflection, um, and I made this cool little clip of all of the uh, cool things. The video is oh, killer, did. man. Nice. It's nice, killer man. because you got this Reaper guy kind of walking the cornfields, and uh, it's got this great imagery of these skeletons burning and that kind of thing. But uh, it's a dark song. It's a fast and heavy one. It's got some downtuned guitar work. But um, like this is the beginning for me where I was aware of Henning. I actually think I saw him play in Firewood years ago when they yeah. were touring the states and yeah. uh he's a good singer but 
really went crazy on this song. Like he goes off, man. This is like death metal in the meaning in the middle. And it's totally, totally, totally killer. So like what did Henning bring to the table, especially on a song like this? Well, to, to give you a little FYI, the middle part, which is the real guttural sick. Yeah. Vocals, is not Henning. It's actually uh, my singer from uh, Act of Defiance, Henry, uh, Henry Derrick. Okay. That, that, so that part, like you said, is super low tune, just really super brutal. And I wanted to do something different. And really, I wanted to have kind of a guest on the record, you know, and, and so I hit up Henry and, you know, he's so great at that kind of stuff. He's such a great, talented uh, singer. Um, I said, hey, what do you think about, you know, creating a part here for this? And, and he, he, was, he was totally into it and he liked the song. And so that's what that is, um, was the guttural stuff is Henry. I'm not saying that Henning couldn't do it because I'm sure he could. But I, I by design, I wanted to have just kind of like a guest singer on there just for that part, just to have, again, experimenting with dynamics right just having you know Henning's a fantastic friggin melodic singer uh melodic aggressive singer that was kind of my idea to get henry to do that yeah, really so, it really really works uh, it's totally killer though love that right one, it, man. It, exactly yeah so it, you know again that song's kind of hit a nerve with some people in a good way because if you look at the the number of views on youtube that song has like i don't know like a hundred and five hundred and ten thousand it's like quadruple the amount for yeah. our other other videos so and i mean that song's about uh it's it's the only song on the record really that's uh not uh fictional it's more of a reality basis about overcoming addiction so it's okay. something that i wrote about where uh ironically most of my songs have a very bad ending you know everybody <laughs> dies and it's all you know bad stuff <laughs> uh, but this song actually well, it's metal right this song has a happy ending where the the person overcomes uh their addiction and you know, moves on to a better life. That's what dark reflection is. You know, why can't you see your dark reflection? Can you see what you're doing to your life by doing this crap and it's yeah. destroying everything around you, but the person realizes it and overcomes it. So in, in, a, in a, an ironic twist, heavy song, it has a happy ending. So where all my other songs don't. Like the uh, video, how it's even in the Reaper to tie into your your storyline. He'll stand over the grave, but he never goes in the grave. Sure. So really cool imagery. Sure. How exactly what you're saying here? That's that person looking, but they they figure it out, right? They end up yeah, a good ending. So. Yeah, John. Yeah. John, I think you had a question. Uh, more of a comment, uh, Sean. You mentioned bands like Trouble and Candlemass a little bit ago. And there's two tracks on this album that my interpretation lends itself. Uh, Ancient Desire, and then the the final track, uh, internal screams, both great tracks have that, um, you know, the tons of elements, a little longer on each of them. How about on these tracks? Where do they rank in your preference of these eight tracks? Well, I love them all. They're all like my kids. So I, you know, <laughs> I don't want to say one's uglier, uglier than the other. No, those, those are, it's funny. You said that because almost every interview I've done track four and track eight are, are their favorites. And and they're my favorites as well. I mean, they're just, oh. it's a little more. It, um, song four has got this whole weird, wacky, um, j almost jazz fusion y part at the beginning of the song. And then it just takes a curveball. You know, they're real drudgy, slower tunes are just super heavy. And like I said before, you know, I, I, I love a lot of, you know, I love Trouble. I'm such a huge fan of Trouble and, and um, Candle Mass and, and, my Dying Bride, like some stuff, My Dying Bride and stuff like that. So, again, it just filters its way um, into the melting pot of creativity for me, you know. It's only doing this kind of metal or that kind of metal, you know. The spectrum's pretty wide, and I stay within those parameters. But having said that, I, I try to do as much as I can that I can get away with. You know what I mean? You're not, you're not going to hear a disco tune, disco metal on, on yeah. anything that I write, but I try to push it as far as I can where you have that variance. And, you know, I, I just like to hear different things on, on a record. So, well, we like that to song, hear different uh, things ancient too. <laughs> totally. On that song, uh, John and I were, were listening to Ancient Desire. Feel up front. And then it just yeah. cuts off. And then I heard this little segment that was reminiscent of Black Sabbath falling off the edge of the world. I don't know if anybody's told you that before, but that whole build up with the pounding drums and then wow, it just sounds like something's going to fall off a cliff. So uh, sure. definitely a favorite of ours, too. John, you. you wanted to talk about uh, track eight as well, right? Eternal Screams. 
Well, I, I, I think he addressed it. It's that, um, you know, his interpretation. That's uh, one of my favorites, yeah. but I think he answered that. I think I. I think this one showcases Glenn at its at his best on the album. Like it's not to say that he doesn't on the rest of the songs, but he really there's a lot of diversity in his playing on that track. So, uh, you know, what can you say about that song? Because that one kind of has ebbs and flows to it. It goes all over the place and you think it's ending and then you're like, oh, no, here it comes again with a, a different kind of atmosphere. So a very, very cool track. But talk about like Glenn, like what he brought to the table on this album. Well, Glenn always brings a lot to the table for, you know, look, the, to sum this up real quickly, you know, years ago when we did the Eidolon yeah. stuff, this is almost 30 years ago now, 1995, I believe. So we had an agreement where, you know, Glenn's, Glenn has a, a recording studio. So he does all the engineering, all the production, all this, all this now getting all the everybody's Pro Tools tracks and, and incorporating into Pro Tools. It's a lot of work. It's a full time endeavor. So, yeah. you know, I said, look, let, I'm more prone to writing songs. I said, look, let me do the bulk of the writing, not all of it, but the bulk of it. And uh, of course, Glenn helps me arrange it. He puts his stamp on it, changes little nuances and stuff. Which the beginning of song four, uh, Ancient Desire, that's all Glenn, all that wacky, jazzy fusion yes. metal stuff is all Glenn. I, I can't play that stuff. <laughs> so, you know, um, his stamp is all over the record. Although I write most of the music, he okay. makes it his own. And, you know, it, I never get offended, you know, I, you know, changing notes or changing keys. They're, they're just notes on a guitar. Dude, just here, here's a, you know, change it. What do I care? As long as it's better than what I'm doing, I'm all for it. So, and a lot of times he'll do something or say, hey, let's, you know, have, let's cut the last verse in half. Let's double the chorus. He's really good with arrangements as well on top of all the other stuff he's doing. So, you know, Glenn's, Glenn's an integral part of everything that we've done. Yeah. Uh, anyways, you know, without Glenn's studio, we wouldn't be talking right now. Without Glenn's studio, we wouldn't have got the Megadeth gig because those Eidolon records are what got us that Megadeth gig. So had yeah. he not had that studio, there's no way we'd be talking right now. So it's uh, it's it's it's, you know, Glenn, Glenn has a signature sound and it's funny. You don't listening to those old Megadeth albums or whatever. But then when you put on this album, you're like, oh, that's Glenn right there. I, the, the best stuff of what we love about him. Um, Sean, one of my favorites, and because I don't want to skip over this one, is track three, uh, Pick Up the Pieces. This one, it's 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 proggy in the middle. And then I kind of uh -huh. I kind of hear Henning doing this, like almost like a Rob Halford painkiller type uh -huh. uh, feel to it. And it's just, even like there's a, you know, when I go for my daily walk, there's that midsection, and I hear like Glenn's left ear bud to the right ear bud, and then it centers out. Mm -hmm. Like just totally little subtle thing, but totally killer. Something that I completely appreciate. Yeah, it's ear candy. I mean, that you know, we, we learned that years ago from from Dave Mustaine. I mean, there's you just put a little, like you said, when you're you don't hear when you put your headphones on, or like we're old, you know, if you yeah. put your he old school headphones on, like we did back in the day. You hear stuff that you don't necessarily hear when you're when you're blasting your Pioneer stereo, you know, at, at full tilt. You get those little ear candy bits and stuff, and, and we're uh, big advocates for, for that. Just having just even little stuff, yeah. That you know, only the chosen few here, but it's it's still an integral part of of what we do and stuff. Um, yeah, that song, you know, that song. Uh, I wrote that whole song that starts with a cool chromatic thing that had a weird time signature in it. I had to count, explain it to my brother. It's just a weird counting thing that that i did as a drummer sometimes you you come up with weird patterns and stuff but uh yeah you know it, it goes from 16th note bass drum uh, bass drum notes to 24th note that's with this whole painkiller reference i keep hearing that as well and it's okay again, that was, uh it's not by design but that's kind of how that song is structured as well but look if somebody thinks it sounds like painkiller i'm not I, i'll take it as a comment but that's it was never yeah. intended to i never tried to write anything that sounds like anything else but if it you know Again, like I said, with all the influences I've had over the years, you know, some sometimes things are gonna gonna bleed into that, and and I'm fine with that. I, I wear that proudly, to, to be honest with you. So it's and it's just it it just shows to me. I really appreciate Henning his variety on his vocals because mm -hmm. he's not a he's not just a, a one one type singer. You know, he's got different ways of singing. So and that's one that really showcases himself there. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the the other song I wanted to, to talk about is Dethroned, right? Because 
I guess this to me, it's a simpler one. Right. And when I first yeah. listened to it, I said, OK, this is OK, but not like one of my favorites. But then it it rings in my head all the time now. I think mm-hmm. it's got a little catchy melodic chorus and, and just a cool little song, you know, and it is the performance video. So it's the the chance for the fans to go out there and actually see this band playing. So uh, talk a little bit about that one. Yeah, it's more certainly more of a uh, uh, just a straightforward metal track. There's no curveballs in that one. Again, like I suggested before, you know, I, I don't want to write the same. I, I wanted to write that straightforward metal metal tune, you know, just four on the floor in your face, just, you know, from start to finish, cat, you know, very um, uh, concise. You know, there's not 16 parts in that song. It's very, and that was, again, that was done by design. I wrote that song with that in mind, you know, because I, I, I wanted to have that song because you know a lot of people just like that straightforward especially in europe there's a lot of guys that just like the straightforward metal stuff and so you know and i'm I'm a big fan of uh uh things like that as well so yeah there's there's not there's barely any ear candy that tune if you put your headphones on but that was by design you know it's just just to me a good straightforward catchy metal track like like you said right you're like yeah you know you listen to it a couple times so i give you know it's it's a catchy it's a catchier tune i don't really write catchy tunes i would say i don't have the big catchy yeah choruses and stuff and and um but uh it's certainly more catchy than <laughs> than eternal screams you know what i mean yeah. so you know yeah so but- it's just a nice nice straightforward track Absolutely. Absolutely. So, yeah, it's uh, another great track. I I mean, Sean, I got to say, like, this band screams to be playing live. And I know it's tough because uh, things are different. I mean, is there any chance you guys are going to get out there on the road? Because I think this stuff needs to be heard in a live setting. Yeah. I mean, look, here's the situation with us is we're kind of in a holding pattern because we're a new band. Uh, Bands are canceling left and right going over to Europe because the cost, you know, the cost of petrol is doubled or tripled. Yep. Bus busing is is almost unavailable because everybody spring for three years, you know. And and I think it would be a, a, a great financial loss if we said, right, let's just go to Europe for five weeks and you know ground and pound. It's like, dude, it's not it's not smart. I I learned this from experience. I've, I've been around the block a couple of times, so you know. I think once the word spreads more, you know, most look most people don't even know who we are, you know. By doing yeah. this with you and and doing these interviews that we're doing is stuff that qu- creates awareness, and that's of course that's what it's all about. But you know, I think we should wait until the next record to where a little more time under our yeah. belts and a little music as well. You know, because now now with the next record we can do the you know the making of and just put put all kinds of videos way beforehand and all that stuff, creating awareness that we are making a second record. Where with this one it was like everything just came out at once. This is the band. This is a record. This is coming out in two months. You know, it's like, oh, yeah. in the midst of all the other hundreds of bands that are doing the same <laughs> thing, right? So it's like we're we're in a wait and see pattern. If if there's a you know if Valken comes calling, you know, next year or two years wanting us to play the festival, we would consider it. But right now we're 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 kind of in a holding pattern with that. So, Sean, um, congratulations on, again, the killer new album. I, I hope that uh, others get a chance to experience it as well. Um, but we wanted to take some time to go back into looking at your history. So, um, I mean, it goes without saying that uh, that your biggest claim to fame is you did play in Megadeth for 10 years. Well, yeah, it was, you know, what can I say? It was a great experience overall. I mean, I have nothing but good things to say about that whole experience. And, you know, I got to establish tons of great friendships with you know, musicians and other bands over the years and that I still have to this day. And uh, you just learn a lot playing in a band that that's, that, that is that big. Um, you know, the whole experience to me was really positive and, and uh, learned quickly what to do and what not to do, what my job entails and, and all that kind of stuff. So, and, you know, it's uh, Dave takes that camp very seriously. It's, you know, I would say almost military style with this execution. So, I mean, it's always been like that. So, you know, and I, I took that very seriously as well. So we were, we we're always on the same page in, in many ways. And, uh, you know, yeah, I just have so many career highlights. It's take an hour to go through them. So, you know, yeah, tons, you, tons you, of great tours. you mentioned career highlights. How cool was that big four stuff over in Bulgaria? I watched that video many times and that was awesome. Reflect back on those times. 
Well, that was a great that was a great show. And most people don't realize that was the first show we played was in Warsaw, Poland. And depending on who you've talked to, um, it's estimated that there was 106,000 people at that show, which is way more than double, which was at Bulgaria. And that was a really great day because it's the first time all the bands mm-hmm. played together after over 25, well over 25 years. The bands had never all, all shared a stage at, at the same concert. And uh, so it was electric, man. Everybody everybody knew it was important and, and um, everybody had their game face on, but you could try, you know, there were smiles underneath. Everybody's excited to do it. And, and everybody went out there and, and kicked ass in a major way. And uh, that was a great day. Um, I don't know. It was just such a, the sea of humanity at that show was, was pretty, uh, pretty intense. And, uh, you know, all the other shows after that we played were great as well. Everybody, again, everybody talks about the, 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 the show in Sofia, Bulgaria, which was, you know, which was played live in movie theaters across the planet as the time changed. And of course it was released on DVD and all that stuff, which was really great. You know, um, again, it was just a, a, a snapshot in time, you know, but we played, I think we played 10 shows in 2010 and another 10, in 2011, if if memory serves, so yeah, just the Yankee. How about the Yankee Stadium show? I was at that one, and that was uh, that was a memory for me being a local guy, just being in the area. I mean, number one, you don't see a lot of concerts at Yankee Stadium, let alone me- field in the outfield. That was totally, totally killer. What, what did you? Anything special about that gig that sticks out? Well, it's Yankee Stadium. I mean, yeah. like you like you said that that was the only metal concert that's ever been at Yankee Stadium, ever. Yeah. I'm sure there's been rock concerts there or, or or pop concerts or whatever, but that's the only metal concert that's ever been at Yankee Stadium. So just to have that, you know, on your check on your resume is pretty cool. Look, I mean, look, when most musicians, when they're young, Americans say, you know, one day I'm going to play Madison Square Garden. Well, well, we one upped it. We we played Yankee Stadium. <laughs> played Yankee Stadium. So that's a that's that's yeah. something that's pretty pretty freaking cool, you know. So it was. Yeah, it was a great. That's the last show, uh, last big four show we played, and uh, yeah, it was it was pretty awesome, man. To just look in that, you know, that's the only. I think that's the only baseball stadium I've ever played, if, if memory serves. So what a wow, what a what a venue to play, right? Yeah, I was fortunate enough to be in the right place at the right time, down in the pit, and uh, of one of James's picks just ended up in my lap right in front of me. But Sean, you know, the the other thing that uh, I have a great memory on was those Gigantors. And I, for, if my memory serves me correct, I think that was the introduction to you and, and your brother Glenn on that first Gigantor in the sheds in the summer. And you guys went around, two, it felt like it was like two or three summers in a row and all different bands each summer. It was almost like the complimentary metal tour to OzFest at that time. So uh, that was a good one. So talk about like... The, that period of time and maybe some of these other bands that you share the stage with. Yeah. Like the, the first one we did, uh, first show again towards 2005. That, that was the first time, uh, yeah. uh, that we went out and played the amphitheaters and played the sheds and stuff. And so that was great fun. You know, we, we actually filmed the first DVD and, and, uh, in our old stomping grounds at, at the, the forum in Mont- in the forum in Montreal. So that was a, a big thing for us, Glenn and I growing up in Canada, that the dream was to play the Montreal forum. Cause that's where we went and saw all the, you know, Sabbath and Ozzy Osbourne and Rush and, yep. all, you know, all those Van Halen, all those bands. It's like one day we're going to be up there and do it multiple times. So um, yeah, I mean, you know, just being out there with Nevermore and Symphony X and, you know, Dream Theater, Fear Factory, we love all those bands. So that was a great, I get a lot, a lot of great camaraderie, you know, just backstage stuff or days off, you know, we would, you know, hang out with, you know, this band or that band or whatever. It was just, just a lot of good camaraderie with that. And then we did, again, we did the same thing the next year with uh, Gigantor 2. We had Arch Enemy and Opeth and that was pretty friggin' awesome. And then we did it again in Children of Bodom. So, you know, we've had some stellar acts on that festival. So it was, it was great fun overall. There was a there was one tour I believe when it came through New York it played at the uh, the Paramount in Madison Square Garden and to me that was my favorite one because it was you guys of course but it had Motorhead Lacuna Coil mm-hmm. and Volbeat that they were just cutting their their teeth in the states and that was one I really remember I remember sitting next to Jose Mangan from Sirius XM in, in the pit and just we were just shooting a shit about all this stuff and it was like wow what a night look at this these great new bands coming up and then you got Megadeth and Lemmy and Motorhead there. That to me was one that stuck me towards the end. 
And and the other one too is Sean was the Heaven and Hell tour, right? You guys went out early on in mm-hmm. what was it, two thousand and seven. Um, I'll never forget the Jersey show because I was at the Radio City show that they filmed the DVD, and then they came out on tour a couple months later, and it was a uh, late May date in on a Saturday night in Jersey at the local amphitheater, PNC Bank Art Center. It was a perfect metal night because I'll never forget it was cold and rainy and dark and smoky. Perfect setting for that show. I can I can remember that one like it was yesterday, and here it is like almost two decades ago. Yeah, it's going with heaven and hell, man. That you know, or sab. Let's let's just call it for what it is. Black Sabbath. Yeah. Deal. I mean, that that was a highlight for me personally in my, in my career. I mean, you know, I, I was still a massive fan of, of the the Sabbath with Dio Records, Heaven and Hell, and and Mob Rules are two of my favorite records ever. Certainly, Mob Rules would be I would say top ten metal record ever for me. Um, so, you know, we caught Ronnie and Vinny at, at a bar more than once uh, after the show at the hotel and, and, you know, had great, Ronnie was an amazing person. I mean, he, he would talk to you like he's known you for 20 years and we had, you know, we had just met at the beginning of the tour, but he remembered everybody's name and we just, you can ask him anything. And he was just so open to, to talking about it. We talked about, of course, working with Richie and Rainbow and all this right. stuff, all this obscure stuff to me and my brother could, could conjure up and ask him. He was just like so gracious with his response and just taking the time and hanging out. Could, couldn't ask for for a nicer person. Uh, really. I mean, he's one of the nicest guys that I've shared a, a, a tour with for sure. Yeah. Uh, Sean, you talk about um, some of the old school stuff and uh, fun fact. I did see that uh, mob rules tour in May of 82. I think doc holiday opened up back in the day, but you're proud of your Canadian ro- roots. And we, we let you up here in Rochester. Like I said, we're a stone's throw from Canada. Let's talk about some of the Canadian metal bands and some of the Canadian drummers, you know, guys like Dan Beeler of exciter, uh, Rob Reiner of Anvil. The, in your early days, did you ever, um, w- w- one, did, were you into those bands Two, you ever play with any of them? And do you follow their careers? Well, we were huge Exciter fans when, when you know, Heavy Metal Maniac came out and, and uh, Violence and Force. I mean, that's at that time, you know, it was pretty fast stuff, you know. So it was <laughs> on the cusp, you know, arguably, you know, a lot of people cite Exciter and, and, and certainly Anvil, too, with, with Metal on Metal, a um, song called 666, which is on um, uh, Metal on Metal, which at that time, I think, was the fastest uh, double bass drum metal song. Yeah. And like I said, Lars, Lars would would testament to that as well. He'd tell you the same thing. And uh Metal Metal is a, is a classic record. I mean, you can't you can't argue that fact. Um, oh, not at all. It was cool that they made that movie. You know, they just for whatever reason they just never seemed to take after that record. And it was nice for them to have some kind of redemption to have that movie. You know, which is a great a great movie as we all know. But um, yeah, you know, I, look, I I grew up on a lot, and for Canada there wasn't a ton of metal bands. Um, certainly, Kick Axe and stuff like that as well. But uh, you know, I was always see into Rush and Max Webster was a in hard rock and, and stuff you know um but uh yeah i mean well i there's so many great canadian bands i mean rush is my favorite band of all time to this day and not not because they're canadian they just happen to be from canada yep. but yeah you know yep. I, they're just that rush is solely the reason why i made that transition from being a, a listener of rock to wanting to become a musician after hearing a record called all the Wolves of stage i mean i couldn't believe human beings could play like that so I was like, man, I want to be a musician too after hearing that record. So especially after hearing, you know, that's they're still my favorite rock band ever. Yeah. Oh, absolutely love Rush. Well, I mentioned these Canadian bands because like last fall, Sword, the Hughes brothers, they released Sword 3. Uh yes, Sword. It, yeah, I get it. Okay, let me interrupt you there. Yeah, yeah. I, not, not yeah. mention Sword, but would be sacrilege. I mean, yeah, I mean, Metal Eyes is, is such an amazing record. I talked yep. to Rick a lot on on uh Facebook Messenger and stuff just profess my love for, for Sorted. That uh, the fact that they finally put out a new record after all these years. Jesus, it's been I think Sweet Dreams came out in '87, so here we are. It's over 35 years later. They finally come out with a new record, and uh, those guys are awesome, man. You know, we all all admit, all of us in Megadeth. We all Dave Mustaine, Dave Ellison, Glenn, and I. We all love Sword. I mean, that, they're just a that record metalizes from start to finish. Every song on that record is stellar, in my opinion. There's not a bad note on that record. 
Well, now that uh, again, you and your brother are in a in a band together, you're part of that heavy metal sibling fraternity. You know, Dan and uh, Rick Hughes, the Sandoval brothers of uh, Armored Saint, yourself, um, you know, the late Eddie and Alex Van Halen. Um, th- th- that's fun stuff. Uh, what about bands like Voivod, Razor, Sacrifice? I know there's a lot of Canadian bands, but um, do you take a you must have Homeland National Pride, you know, being the being these uh, Canadian guys. You ever, sure. Uh, now they all they all they all came out around a little bit later. So yeah, yep. sir, of course, it's obviously, sacrifice. Voivod is they're just and again they just they're putting on new music now. Yep. It's just stellar stuff. I mean, they're still kicking and they're still making viable music now. You know, I was I was in the thrash band for uh for a minute called Infernal Majesty uh in the late '80s, which put out a, a fantastic record called None Shall Defy. I mean, I, I think that's one of the best thrash records records ever made. Um that band is grossly overlooked. I mean, they're freaking legends in my mind, you know, and the, with the underground thrash movement, certainly they're, they're listed as, you know, that record is just on the list of many people for being one of the best thrash records ever. But of course, yeah. Ray, Razor. I mean, evil yeah. Gators. I mean, we were fans of all that, that record. I still play that record a oh, lot to this day. I mean, that every song on that record is just friggin' classic, man. I mean, that just, all the thrash, yeah, it's all the thrash stuff that, which again came around, you know, 84, 85 ish and stuff. That's when all these bands started to pop after, after Kill 'em All came out and, and all that good stuff. So, yeah, all the bands you mentioned there, I, I love them all. I think they all make, had great uh, musical careers. And, and uh, again, Voivod yeah. with Voivod, that it's heavier now than it's ever been. It's still wacky and techno weird and all that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Space. Whatever you want to, you know, Voivod's on their own planet, which which is great, you know. So mm-hmm. they're they're, uh, you know, Chewy's a great addition to that band, you know, replacing mm-hmm. Piggy. So I mean, yeah, there's yeah. No, nobody else who could have done that. I don't think anybody could replace Piggy except uh, Chewy. So what? Yeah, what man. about here? Here's a hidden gem, um, Pile Driver. Yeah, <laughs> my buddy Steve actually Pile Driver played a bunch. Of course, he's he's passed now. He's he's passed away. But uh, yeah, Gord. not long, not probably with within the uh, five years before he passed away. My buddy Steve was a guitar player in that band, and uh, they went over and did a bunch of shows in Europe and stuff. And you know, yeah, that yeah, again, talk about a hidden jam. That that's <laughs> you know, metal, metal Inquisition. That just the cover of that record was so freaking metal. I, I remember going to uh, up the music store in Montreal and seeing. I'm like, oh, who is who are these guys? You know, they got to be heavy. You know. I'm going to share one fun fact. Back in 86, I graduated high school and I went to school in uh, Canada for a year recording art school. And I had a chance to go to school with this guy that was friends with Anvil, friends with Lips. And he arranged it. I had some buddies up for the weekend and we went to the gas works, to see the band play. And he um, arranged it. I was able to introduce the band. So I got went up on stage and the look on my buddy's eyes is like, oh, my God. I'm like, oh, I guess works. Welcome, Anvil. And they go into March of the Crabs. And so uh, just props to Canada. I always have a soft spot in my heart. Just going back, circling back to Rush. I mean, I, I, it's one of my top three bands as well. I can't even imagine a kid living up there and and like being a rush fan, like what were some of the experiences you had? Did you check them out at the forum or shows? Like I did that like silly pilgrimage a couple of years ago, pre COVID where my wife and kids, we went up to Niagara falls. And then I said, okay, we're going to do a half a day to do a rush tour. We're going to go to the the front of the ministry and I'm going to take photos there. And I'm going to find the school where subdivisions was filmed and all this other stuff. So <laughs> what was it like being a rush fan as a kid or a teenager up there? Yeah. I mean, well, look, I, the first concert I ever went to was, um, released it on dvd uh it's uh, you can find it on on youtube that had a whole concert and they talked about certain things and so the first show rock show i ever saw as a kid was filmed for future release so that's kind of a neat thing that's i uh, was part of that um that was at the forum right the montreal yeah, forum yeah, wow that's, that's great forum. yeah it's my first show 1981 and uh you know what you know look again just it just so happens that russia's canadian i didn't I didn't love Rush or was exposed to Rush because they were Canadian. It's, but 
it's certainly a cool thing that they're all from, you know, all from Toronto area. And, uh, you know, again, you know, it's, it's just, uh, I have so many great experiences growing up, uh, when I did in Montreal, the, the, the music scene was so vibrant. It's still that way. There's the fans up in Quebec are so hardcore and, uh, you know, they're the more, most rabid fans, I would say, in Canada that from my experience of, of playing so many shows up in Canada. And again, they're all all the cities that we played are great, you know, all, right across the country and stuff. But uh, something of just rabid fans with music and, and uh, you know, it just it was a great upbringing for me uh, to be exposed to all that stuff and seeing all those concerts at the forum. You know, Rush is my first Van Halen Fair Warning Tour is my second show. Ozzy Osbourne, uh, Dire Madman was my third. Um, you know, uh, Mob Rules was my fourth show. I just, I just on and on and on and on. Saw so many stellar shows there. I saw Queen. I saw Queen 1982, which was also filmed for DVD. It's the only they played two nights in Montreal and filmed that for DVD, which is on YouTube. Yeah, I think I've seen that. I didn't, yep. I don't even know why. I don't even know why they did it. To be honest, because they were not on tour. It was between tours. Wow, so I went awesome. saw that show. Which is amazing, yeah. Mm -hmm. Saw that Queen, a huge, huge Queen fan as well. So, but it just went on and on and on with so saw so many great concerts growing up, and uh, it was just, just a really exciting time. And like you, it's funny you mentioned uh, House Guitars in Rochester. I actually did a drum clinic there, so I mm -hmm. know exactly. I know exactly. You go downstairs, and they've got that huge music store down there, and they have all kinds of friggin' concert shirts and all that stuff. That place is friggin' awesome. It is awesome. It's um legendary the great 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 house of guitars but um uh, uh you yeah. mentioned uh montreal were you there for the uh guns and roses debacle or the uh metallica when james burn himself anything like that wasn't the forum though was it that was the that was olympic stadium no yeah. I, I i was in america by by that time i, I moved to america at the end of 19, uh, 1987 so that happened i think in 92 or 93 i think that yeah. happened yeah. so i was i was uh, long gone um, at that point. So, but no, I. So, yeah, I happened at Olympic Stadium in Montreal. And circling yeah. back, those were my first shows too. Rush 81 moving pictures up here in Rochester and that Van Halen fair warning. The, you know, it's very, very lucky. Those were my favorite bands and seeing them at the peak of their career moving pictures. My God. It doesn't get any better than that. And I, I followed those bands their entire careers. I saw all, all the tours and very fortunate, Sean, for us to see that kind of stuff because it just isn't like that anymore. Yeah. So Sean, well, did you ever, again, go ahead. No, I was going to say, did you ever take a pilgrimage up to lay studio? No. And I, I, I regrettably, uh, yeah. I never got up there and, and Ironically enough, my science teacher in high school, I'll tell you something real quick. My uh, science teacher in high school lived in Morin Heights, Quebec. So he would, I think it was 45 minutes away or a little bit less than an hour. He would drive to school and was a science teacher. So Rush was recording, Rush was recording. He knew a guy who worked at the studio there. Signals. And I asked for the address to the studio from, from Mr. Boyd, my science teacher. And so I sent Neil Peart a letter. Most people don't know this. And I said, hey, we're big fans, you know, and I was just starting my, my little stupid high school band. I said, you know, can we be your support act on, on tour? He wrote me a, a postcard back and, and scorched me pretty good. It's like, dude, it takes a lot of, you know, a lot of time and a lot of, you know, experience to get from where you are to where, you, you know, to where we are and stuff like that. And, you know, it was a bit of a, you know. But it, I always remembered it, you know, because it's it was such a, a stupid request as a 14, 15 year old kid, you know, but I was just I was just happy to even get a response from him, even though he kind of roasted me a little bit. It was kind of funny. But, uh, you know, it was. And, but he sent me a postcard of him. There's a famous shot where he's on the lake with his red drum kit. He's on, on the raft. His drum kits on the. Yeah. You know, like yeah. The raft, the drum kit. He that was the postcard. He sent me a postcard back with that picture on it. And uh, wow. it was very cool. So, so yeah, that's when they were recording signals. That was like uh, eighty two. Do you still have the postcard? Yeah, something like that. So again, no, no, I misplaced it somewhere along the way, stupidly. Right? You know, <laughs> you, do, you do stupid things when you're when you're young, and you hear it all this time later. I really wish I had it, but true oh, story. Oh my god, it's yeah. awesome. But, but yep. what a testament to the person he was, right? To take the time to write you back. 
right? Took yeah, it seriously, you know, again, which is great. It, yeah, it was great, even though, you know, that he just, but again, he was earnest in what he was saying is, you know, he didn't can't code or sugarcoat anything, but, it, you know, how can you expect, you know, a bunch of 15 year olds to go on tour with, right? You don't even, the scope of what that entails, you, you know, you don't even know as a kid, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so it was kind of funny, he, mm -hmm. you know, he, it was, he was a little stern, but, it, you know, he was certainly nice about it, but it was, it, I always remembered that, uh, that happening, but yeah, he, even for him to even, uh, respond was was a yeah. pretty cool thing you now so yeah did you ever have a chance to meet neil getty or alex no i did not my son uh, met uh, alex and getty at a meet and greet here in atlanta a friend of mine uh, uh hooked me up i was on tour of course so i couldn't go to the show um that show and uh, a friend of mine who was working with uh, with rush um got my son into that meet and greet and stuff so he's got a picture somewhere is it here in the room Hold on, I'm looking real quick. No, it's not in this room, but no, yes, it is in this room. Look. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Son. That's Sweet, awesome. Yeah. Man. yeah, I think so. You know, he, he, that really pissed me off. I'm, my son's a massive Rush fan. Yeah. Yeah, I'm like, so you see, I was like, thanks a lot, jerk, for sending, you know. <laughs> so, no, it was a thrill for him, you know. Um, he's a massive Rush fan. So he likes all the old, you know, I expose him to Crest Steel and all the old stuff. Yeah. So he's a big fan of, you know, Phil the Kings and all that stuff. So, you know. What's, no, your, I never met what's your favorite Rush album? Hemispheres. Why Hemispheres? Just because of La Villa? No. I loved, I loved that song, but I heard that song. So, it's like listening to Stairway to Heaven. Great tunes heard them too much and i played la villa strangiato so many freaking times as a kid learning it you know that which took me forever as, as a kid but um i've heard that song eight billion times so at this point it's my least favorite song on that record but <laughs> yeah. i love it you know circumstance of course the song hemispheres i think is is one of my all-time favorite uh, rush songs um you know circumstances the trees all, all that stuff it's just a so that's close first you know between that farewell the king Everybody, almost everybody would say moving pictures for me. I love that moving pictures, of course, but that's that's probably my fourth favorite. So, you know, hemi on any given day, hemispheres, permanent waves, Farewell of the Kings are one, two, and three. And, and you, they can switch. And, and it depends what mood you're in. Oh, sure. am, I, am I a Farewell the Kings mood? Or, right. you know, um, I love moving pictures. Uh, you know, permanent waves, side two of permanent waves. I love yeah. Grace Under Pressure. I love signals. Yeah. So. All right. Well, I'll let you wrap this up because like, uh, I want to hear some rush power windows. Just everything about that. <laughs> we could go on all day, Sean, but this is a uh, really, really cool. Last question. What, you, what allegiance hockey? I'm assuming you're a Habs fan being from Montreal. No, no, no everybody. No, a quick story with that my growing up in, in uh, Montreal, uh, my father was adamant about, hating the halves and okay. for whatever reason and my older brother well as well they did not like watching uh the montreal canadians at all so the closest uh Bruins, which now i'm so glad that happened because and this is the 70s uh so I, we watched all the bruins games and i just to this day bobby Orr is my favorite hockey player that's ever graced mm -hmm. the planet i mean he revolutionized the position of you know yeah. offensive defensemen so um you know, uh, we were exposed to that. I mean, I had allegiance to the Boston Bruins for many years until I moved to Florida in the late 80s, which then I was cut off from all hockey. They didn't have ESPN yeah. playing hockey games or anything back then. So I lost touch with it for right now. I don't have a favorite team, which is kind of weird. Yeah. Um, I like, you know, I like a lot of teams and stuff, but I'm not like super mental hardcore like I was when I was young uh, uh, watching Boston, you know, and just the Boston uh, Philly rivalry, you know. You know Terry O'Reilly. Yeah, back then, Bill definitely. Had so many great fights and stuff, and, and the Bruins. That you know. Oh yeah. Great, a lot of great fighters on, on Stan Jonathan's a great fighter. The Bruins and stuff, and just that seventies, you know, mid yeah. to late seventies going into the eighties. That was, you know, I call not in his career, but most of his career watching it as a youngster. So he's. If I met that dude, I tell you what, I mean that I'd probably start bawling on the spot, you know. Just to, I, I'm such a huge uh, fan of Bobby Orr, you know. So you but, speak. You sp go ahead. Real quick, uh, the first time we played Montreal Forum, no, the second time we played Montreal Forum, me and my brother were walking around. You know, we always would walk around the building and stuff. So we walk into the back of the dressing room. Dave's got a big smile on his face, and I see about several Montreal Canadian shirts on there. 
with our names in the back. I'm like, I said, I said who? He said, D. LaFleur. I said, you're so full of it. There's no way. He goes, oh, really? They had a picture of Dave and James Lomenzo with Gila Fleur holding the shirts. And we missed it by five minutes. Oh, Matt. man. So uh, Guy Lafleur so, hung around and watched the Megadeth show. That is a story in and of itself. Yeah. Well, that, I don't think he stayed for the show. He came in. I think he came in with yeah. his entourage, presented okay. the shirts for whatever reason, and then and left shortly after. But I had I was this close to having a uh, a conversation with Guy Lafleur in, in his stomping ground. So that I have a shirt in my closet. I still have it. I've never worn it. So it's much okay. Says Drover on the back. Cool. I've, I've I've had it for since 2006. <laughs> I've had that shirt. So that what? kind of missed opportunity, but very cool. Wow. What about this uh, Steeler blanket in the background? Yeah, I'm a massive again. Um, being exp you know growing in Montreal, Pittsburgh um, Steelers were the fee that we would get for football, and their rivalry, of course, was, was Dallas Cowboys, which I hated that team back in the day. I still hate them sports so i mean i just just um you know bradshaw and all, all those guys from the 70 guys I, I still think chuck Knoll is one of the top five coaches that's ever coached the nfl and and mm -hmm. uh, even now i mean they got a great a great young kid um pick it out of out of uh pitt university they've got a great new quarterback now after ben retired roethlisberger so i think we got a really bright future um going into this season the last season was kind of a rebuild i would say and still have a pretty decent season but the, the future looks really bright for uh for Steelers fans. um I love um, I love the NFL and of course college football and stuff but for NFL the Steelers are my guys wow That's well awesome. I I'm uh both Walt and I were uh Miami Dolphin fans here I am I, and here I am in Bill's country I can't yeah, that get makes away. no sense oh I I, I like uh, no, you don't no like sense. The, like you don't like uh <laughs> the Canadians Sure, um, yeah. Oh, it, me it makes Buffalo. no sense, but me, right, right. Well, I'll me, tell you real Buffalo. quick. Go ahead. Dan Marino is my favorite all time quarterback, and he played for Pitt going into college. Going to go to the Steelers, but I like Miami in the 80s sorely for that reason, is because Dan Marino was a quarterback, and, and of course, Shula was an amazing coach as well. Uh, they had some great receivers, you know, Clayton Duper, so, you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, that's the only reason I like. Uh, Miami in the, in the 80s and into the 90s was, I, I still say to this day, you know, you put Marino and, and any of those teams that won Super Bowls and he they he would have won even more. You know, I just think he's just the best quarterback that's that's ever played, in my opinion. Well, thanks. I appreciate that. <laughs> like you can I, get a I, kick out of this. Uh, I was uh, in 94, I was at the Giant Stadium game against the Jets with the famous spike play. I was in yep. the low bowl and this past September, I took my two sons to see the Jets Dolphins game down there, and we were waiting for autographs on the outside by the buses. And Marino works for the team, and he came out, and he was about 10 feet from the gate, and everybody's screaming his name. He never came over, but I yelled out. I said, Dan, Dan, I was at the spike game over there where the old Giant Stadium was in the corner. And he looked. And he just literally looked up at me and he went and he gave me like the finger and he was like this <laughs> high five. So that was my only brush in with Dan Marino, but I got him to look me in the eye and give me a thumbs up. And that was good enough. And I got pictures of that, him looking at me. So that's amazing. That's amazing. But yeah, yeah. But real quick, you know, you being in Bill's country, um, I was a big Buffalo Bills fan too. I mean, again, they lost four Super Bowls in a row. That'll never be going to the Super Bowl four years in a row is, 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 an amazing thing in itself. I don't think it's ever going to happen again. So the fact a lot of people say, oh, they lost, you know, but they, you know, they should have won that first one against the Giants. Everybody knows it. He missed the field goal, you know, things happen, but they played the better, they were the better team that day. They just, just missed the kick. Were you know, they the better just, team that day? Absolutely. In my opinion, sure. It was a great game. It was a close game, but I think I think they played better than the Giants. I have to disagree that because the Giants took Buffalo out of their game, it made them not play their game and limited. But yet everyone. they still hung in there, though, didn't they? Yeah, you know. Again, you're, you know, we're all <laughs> Monday morning quarterbacks, right? So yeah, I mean, it's. I just uh, wish they would have won that. I wish they would have won that game. It would have just altered their future in such a great way. They got a great team now the last, you know, several years, you know, three, four years, they've had a really solid team and they're just getting better and better. And 
It's great for the city. It's great for upstate New York. You know that. I mean, you no, know. no, I, I need serious help because I, I'm a fish out of water up here and it's bad. Right. Man. I, yeah. <laughs> it's just. And, you know, it's it just sucked, you know, and I played a lot of golf tournaments, a lot of celebrity golf tournaments, Daryl Talley, Bruce Smith. They show up at a lot of these events, um, which is awesome. I still haven't even went and, inter- you know, try to introduce myself to say hello or anything. But Bruce Smith is still huge. He's freaking huge, man. That guy is scary, man. But uh, anyway, I, I, I like I always like the Buffalo Bills as well. You know, uh, so. It doesn't. Ma- yeah, no, I respect that. But yeah, all joking aside, I am a fish out of water up here. There is no d- Miami and Buffalo. What Miami did to Buffalo in the 70s, they will never forget. Yeah, I yeah, mean, it, right. that, that hatred for Bill's Bill's fans was pushed down to generation. Like there's yeah, fourth generation course. Bills fans that cannot stand Miami. So we have, uh, we have a Buffalo Bill, we have a Buffalo Bills bar about about ten minutes from my house. Um, wow! And they make all the you know all the wings and all that stuff, and and uh, it's a great place. But you, there's no way you're you're getting into that place on on Sunday during football season unless you get there at about uh, as soon as that door opens because that place is packed with. In there one time and i couldn't even there was n- literally nowhere for me even to stand i was like i had to turn around and leave because it was there's just nowhere to go but i tell mm-hmm. you what man those those fans are nutty and it's it's uh it's fun to watch that, that you know they have su- such a deep passion for their team have you ever been to buffalo for a game no no i have not no it sucks yeah i mean you know i just never there's always opportunities that you know i missed a lot of opportunities to go to steelers games because I was on tour, you know what I mean? I had friends, hey, I got, you know, like going to the Masters. I could have, I had people who had tickets to go see the Masters up in Augusta. I, I couldn't go because I was on tour. Same with the Steelers stuff. It's a lot of missed opportunities uh, for that just because I wasn't home. I wasn't available. So, you yeah, know, yeah. it sucks, but what are you going to do? <laughs> it's a good problems to have, Sean. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, uh, so Sean, best of luck. It was great chatting with you today about Withering Scorns, your back history, sports and metal, and everything else in between. Great discussion over coffee and a great way to start the weekend. So best of luck. Thanks, guys. I really appreciate you having me on the show. All right. Great. Care, Thanks, Sean. Sean. Have a good one. All right. Take care of yourselves. Cheers. Metal for Life. Thank you for listening to Metal Mayhem ROC. Check out our website at MetalMayhemROC.com for information on podcasts, archives, links to all our live radio shows, and all sorts of info. Please like, follow, and share with everyone, even your non-metal friends. And always remember to keep it heavy.